practice the psychic reading exercise if you want. I'm picking up a signal. Somebody has a question. <clears throat> Somebody's wondering, is the exam going to be online this year? Mm -hmm. Who is wondering that? Exactly. <laughs> yes, it will be online this year. Yeah. Any other questions? We will have a revision lecture before the end of the semester in the last week. I, I'm a little bit uh, ruffled or whatever you want to call it today because I, the Wi-Fi on my laptop started stopped working about two hours ago and then I tried to do an update on the operating system and it didn't finish until like five minutes ago. <laughs> And then the projector configuration was uh, a little bit strange. So um, I flustered, that's the word. I feel a little bit flustered. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about libraries and open source software. I actually have a theory that open source software will save the world. I don't know about anybody else, but um, I actually believe that. So today we're going to talk about uh, using libraries, third-party libraries, and we're going to talk about open source software, open source software. The lab time this week will basically be dedicated to your coursework, right? The next, the the labs for the remainder of the semester or December and we will probably have a lecture that is a lecture slot freed up to work on your uh, coursework as well. I will let you know and update the Moodle page as we go along. Any, any questions about the rest of the semester? Also please um, Ask your questions either in lecture or in the questions channel on Teams, the DMS questions channel on Teams. Because, you know, there are three, 300-ish students, even though not all 300 are here. It's best if somebody asks a question and the whole class gets to see the question and then we get to give the answer to the whole class. Imagine if all 300 <coughs> students ask like the same question or something, it just would not be possible to answer them all individually. Okay, some tips on the coursework. <clears throat> we have a lot of screen capture demos, screen capture demonstration software so to set up IntelliJ, to set up Git, your local Git client and the GitLab server. To to set up uh, communication between your, your laptop and the GitLab server. Setting up a Maven project, setting up a Gradle project, setting up a JavaFX project. I added a new one last week, hopefully somebody noticed. Setting up JUnit in a JavaFX project or a Maven project. Like, welcome to the JUnit, hello world. And uh, the more complicated ones have text descriptions, so if you look inside the video description, you can see text like step one, do this, step two, do this, for the more complicated ones. That's the Git one, and the, the latest one, the JUnit one, I, I typed out the instructions. So that should all give you some jump start on, on these. I call these administrative tasks, personally. Like for me, software engineering is all about the, you know, what objects should I create and how should I organize my code and these setting up the software, I, I think of as actually an administrative task. Some people might call it configuration management. But when you start a new job, you might spend a day or two trying to set up your new, your new environment and then that's, that's it, it's a one-time cost. And then the rest of the time, really, it's about developing the software or 
administration is a small portion and there'll be an administrator there to help with that. I'm also seeing some patterns when in the questions that I get. So very often uh, I'll get a question and I, and I can see from the question, oh, this person has not watched this screen capture demo. Or, oh, this person has not watched the, the guidelines on debugging your software. So sometimes my replies are just, oh, watch the video on this topic. Um, some of you may have noticed that, but it's very common that I can tell from the question what experience you've had, whether you've attended lectures or watched the screen capture demos. I can pretty much tell who has done that. I suppose there's a third option, which is you were here, but you were asleep <laughs> at the time. That's possible. And I've fallen asleep in lecture too, so I'm not, I'm not judging. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about philosophies of software development. So during your time as a software developer, you'll work on lots of different kinds of projects. Some of these have open source and some of them make use of third party or open source libraries. You might develop private code to be open source or vice versa. In, the most com in a very common scenario, you'll be working for a company the, the, the source will be closed or private, but it will use open source third-party software. Can anybody think of a famous example of that? There's quite a famous example of that, a what's normally a closed name? Uh, Daniel. Daniel. Uh, Linux. Linux. Linux is all open source. Yeah. I was, the question was, can you think of a closed, a famous closed source project that uses open source uh, as, as a third party library? There's quite a famous uh, example of this that nobody notices, uh, but it's, it's, it's famous. It might, it's losing its fame though. I guess I should, might should probably say it used to be famous. I think it's no longer, it's the, the fame is, has dropped, it's gone. Oh, uh, Internet Explorer, has anybody heard of Internet Explorer before? That Microsoft browser? I think it's, it's dead now, is that true? I think it's dead. But the uh, Microsoft was trying to develop a web browser and they could see that they were behind the competition so they said, oh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll download an open source web browser and we'll use that as our base and then develop our commercial version which uses the open source as its, uh, you know, as its base, as a third party library. Did anybody know that? It's a very, very, uh, I don't know, I think it's an interesting piece of trivia. It's not, it's not a test question or anything. It's probably not going to appear on a pub quiz, unfortunately. But it is an interesting, it's interesting to think of a company like Microsoft panicking and going, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Let's download an open source solution and start from there. Because they have so much, like 20 million developers, endless money, but still they chose this as their solution for the web browser. Anybody happen to know which web browser, which open source web browser? They would, it, you have to be a hardcore geek, hardcore geek to know the answer to this question. Does anybody know the name of the open source web browser they downloaded and, and built Internet Explorer on? <laughs> there are no hardcore geeks here yet. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> uh, Mozilla. Is the name of the open source browser. I don't know, I, I guess it still exists somewhere, but anyways, that was the one they downloaded and built their commercial application on. So, getting some pub quiz, uh, pub quiz extras today. <clears throat> so, I think everybody here knows that we're using third party libraries in our uh, DMS module, right? 
So a library, a third party software package and ready to use in your application. It's a shared resource. Can anybody think of an example of a third party library that we're using in, D in DMS in the coursework? I can think of at least two. Anybody? <laughs> JUnit, right, that's one of the third-party libraries, and um, Java, right, <coughs> Java is a, is a library. The Java library is open source, it's, it, and then you have to, you use the API and then you compile it. The JUnit library is already compiled. <laughs> right, we're using, um, well, we're also using <coughs> Java docs, for example. Right, and you, this is, the JDK is a library, right? The Java library. So we're using libraries all over the place. Java FX is another library, right? So what's in a library? It may consist of a JAR file. So that's after it's been compiled, right? That's a, that's a binary file. And then you, you include that JAR file in your um, in your software, right? You can also include a library that is not yet compiled, right? Like the Java API. And then you compile it on your, on your specific platforms. Usually when you uh, use libraries, you're not compiling them beforehand. Does anybody know why that is? So usually, like for example, if you're using some library, like a GUI library or a computer graphics library, you do not compile them beforehand, like with this jar example. Anybody want to, anybody know the answer to that? It's because the binary files are usually platform dependent. In other words, they change depending on which operating system you're using. <coughs> Java made a special, Java is special in that they're trying to be platform independent. So in this case, you can compile a library beforehand and uh, then run it on any operating system. That's the theory. How, how well that works in reality, I'm not 100% sure. But that is the theory behind that. So usually you have to compile the libraries for your target operating system, right? The, the Mac programs, a Mac binary file does not automatically run on a Windows binary file, uh, Windows operating system, and vice versa, and the same with Linux. Okay, and there's usually a license associated with that library, and we're going to talk about licenses today. <clears throat> So we can use JAR files. If we're programming in the Java, Lover, Java programming language, we can use JAR files because the, uh, they are theoretically platform independent. And that also includes multiple versions of the same operating system, right? Like the Mac operating system changes every year, so does Windows and so on. And we reference this in our project. Does anybody know what these references in the projects are called? in Maven, in Gradle, these, these references to external libraries. Anybody know the magic word they're using? Name? Maximilian. Maximilian. Dependencies. Yes. Very good. Dependencies. Yes. So in the, one of the screen capture demos, I think it's the setting up a Maven project. You'll see there it includes a dependency, which is to the JUnit library. So we, we import the relevant parts in, of the library into our code. We make use of the methods that somebody else has written, thank goodness, <laughs> so we don't have to write, write everything from scratch. You can package them up in your, in your application or you can include them in your project source distribution. If you distribute source code, there are, there's usually something called a license associated with that source code, and that is basically a set of rules that say, like, 
You can use my source code, however, if there are some rules that you're supposed to follow if you want to use my source code. And actually, we see this, we see this all the time. <clears throat> Does anybody know where we see this all the time? We see this, this is a funny, this is a very funny uh, topic actually, and I, I wonder about it sometimes because I'm very strange. But we see these licenses all the time. Does anybody know where we see those licenses all the time? There's another kind of word for it. Name? Oh, I was just gonna say, usually on the side of what, like if you go to like a repo, they'll be on the side like a license, and it'll tell you the name of the license. That's correct, that's correct. They, so we see them when we're developing software with third party, uh, for example, libraries, but there's another place where we see them. It's not exactly the same, but it's very, very similar. So the license is for developers, right? It's saying how other developers can use the libraries. What I was just think thinking about was the terms of agreement. So every time you install a piece of software, right? you always have to click on the terms of agreement. That's for users, not the developers. Everybody notices that, right? The, the thing is, you do it so often that you don't notice it anymore, right? But I've all, in those terms of agreement are usually like 500 pages long or something, and you scroll to the bottom. And, and, um, but that's the same idea. The terms, the terms of usage, like you agree to these terms before you use this software. It's the same idea. One's for targeted at developers, and the one I'm talking about just now as an example is targeted at users. But the problem with the terms, those terms is they're so long, right? Can I, I, so what I've wondered sometimes is does, how much time would it actually take to read those? If you, if you had to read them from start to finish every time you install a piece of software, how many pages would you be reading actually? And how long would it take? I suspect it would take a, at least an hour every day, like literally every day, because you're always doing updates on your phone and your laptops and so on. And I just did one here and it was causing me problems uh, before the lecture. <clears throat> Okay, you can also use build files to help with collaborative development using libraries. Build files, those are the files that tell the, the compiler what to compile, which order to compile it in, which third-party libraries are included, dependencies, that's called a POM file in a Maven project, for example. And Maven and Gradle external libraries are included using dependencies. <clears throat> So, Maven and Gradle are called build systems. That's not a very pr uh, precise term, but that's what, the, what they're called. So they assemble all the libraries for you. They know how to compile your project using the external libraries. What order it has to be compiled in, because the, which order, the order in which your objects are compiled actually makes a difference. Right. And so the in and where to find the dependencies is also important. That information has to be stored somewhere. So you can see an example of this in action. Uh, the screen capture demo I made of setting up a Maven project is an, an example of this. I can see by the way, I do look at the, the number of views for those different videos. So I can see kind of what percentage of the, the class is kind of following along and actually uh, looking at the different things. And the Git one is very, very popular. <laughs> so the Git one is the one that everybody's looking at, I can see, because it's very tricky to set up. Okay, so that's enough about libraries. <clears throat> Let's talk about open source software development and maintenance. Just as, just for a, as a fun exercise, 
This doesn't sound like the most important and exciting topic ever in the world, but just as a fun exercise, I googled what percentage of software is open source. So, you know, there are there are different numbers depending on which reports you look at. But anyways, the numbers the the numbers are always high. So this is actually a very important topic and it's interesting. At least I find it very, very interesting. <clears throat> you know, that, that, that all the, the reports are going to be different. So there's 91% and there are some more. But Internet Explorer is a good example. Probably Chrome. It would be interesting to know if Chrome is... Uh, probably Chrome is using some open source software itself. itself or um, maybe it is open source. So it's, it's really important actually. Does anybody remember the slide of the Linux server versus the Windows server? That, that the call graph, the collaboration diagram. So yeah, the Linux one is the one that is well organized and well designed. That's the open source one. And then the, the Microsoft server is the closed source one. You could notice a difference in the quality, right, of those, those two systems. And then the quality affects the popularity of those systems, right? The higher the quality is, the more popular it's going to be. <clears throat> so open source software, what is open source software? It's generally free software that uses any license approved by the open source initiative from their list of approved open source licenses. So those are the terms of use for developers. Free open source, what is free open source software? Software that gives the users the rights to run, copy, distribute, change, and improve as they see it without them asking permission or making payments to any external group or person. Right. And there's a special website, right? And of course, there are lots of documents, documentation, and books on this topic. This is a huge topic. It's a huge movement. It's a huge initiative. And why? Why do I think it's going to save the world? It's because open source software has a life of its own and it's not governed by any particular person or institution, generally speaking. So imagine the scenario where every web server was a Microsoft web server, like a Microsoft SQL server or something like that. And then one day Microsoft goes out of business it's hard to imagine, but it could happen someday. Then that would be a big problem, right? If one central authority controlled all the web servers and then that, that central authority went out of business, right? That would be a big problem. Luckily, that's not the, that's not the, the scenario we're living under, but if we, if we didn't have the internet, it seems like the world would end now, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of the reasons I think that open source software is going to save the world um, because it's not controlled by uh, one person, right? And one of the initial, uh, let's say, pr promoters of this idea is Richard Stallman. It's not very difficult to imagine. Right. If you if you're writing source code, imagine uh, you're writing source code and you knew it was going to be open source. You know that that's going to happen. Like you know that you have to publish it to the public on GitHub. Do you think that you, you're going to write better quality source code if you know it's going to be exposed to the public? Yeah, probably. Right, you're gonna if you know that anybody can see what you're doing or is gonna be able to see what you're doing, chances are you're gonna put more effort into it. And in fact, some software engineering classes have this as an exercise, like what your submissions have to be open source. Right. 
It's, it's, it's similar, uh, the, the analogy that I've often heard used is the, is the car, like buying a car that we already mentioned. Imagine you're going to buy a car and you, and you say, can I just look under the hood to see what the engine looks like? This is gonna be a very important exercise, by the way, if you're buying a used car. Right? If you're buying a used car, actually you want to make sure, look underneath the hood to see what it looks like. You wanna check for, anybody know what you wanna check for? Like one of the obvious things? Is anybody here ever bought a used car before? <laughs> any, any um, what are they called? Uh, those people? mechanic heads or something I can't remember there's a term for people that are good at working on cars um, but I can't remember what it's called anybody here ever bought a used car no that's surprising anyways you definitely want to pop the hood and look for oil leaks right that's one of the most obvious things you want to look for oil leaks you're getting free car advice. You want to look for uh, any any other leaks? Anybody want to take a guess? Engine coolant leaks. You want to look for engine coolant leaks. And well, if you're really, really advanced, you want to look for brake fluid leaks. <laughs> but the, the two big ones are oil leaks and engine coolant leaks. And imagine you're trying to buy that car, it doesn't matter which scenario, and the person says, sorry, you can't look underneath the hood. Uh, no. That's a clear sign that you can't buy that car, right? That's, that's not a good thing. So this is the same idea. It's like, if you're buying software, you should be able to look at it, actually, and check. Are they following coding conventions? Like, what is the quality of this product that I'm buying? That's really the idea. You want to be able to see it. So why go open source? It's generally higher quality, right? Because you know that other people are gonna be looking at it. And of course, with the car analogy, it still works, right? If you know that you can open the hood, then hopefully the owner of that car is gonna fix the oil leaks and fix the radiator leaks and fix any other leaks, right? Um, open source software is more customizable. It's more, it's, it's uh, more improvable, right? Bugs and bug fixing is gonna be easier, right? Finding bugs is gonna be easier. Redistribution is gonna also be easier. It's transparent, it's free. You can also compile it on different target platforms. Maybe you want to uh, write a version for a brand new piece of hardware. Maybe that happens. Maybe Google one day says, okay, we're going to release our own desktop operating system and, and um, with our own laptops and you want to you want to compile your software onto that new, new environment, right? That's more uh, possible with open source software. So <clears throat> this is also supported by many industry institutions as we just, Google just, um, just showed us. Open source software is also good, it can be good advertising, right? Because it implies good quality. It can also attract talented developers to, to the company, right? More development is possible. Maybe somebody's already familiar and been developing that product before they even started working at your company. Um, contributions can be made by potential employees to, to demonstrate their skills and maybe they're developing new skills, right, that they weren't, current, weren't um, you know, previously no, uh, competent in. Yeah, and, and of course, there's another good reason why companies use open source software, right? It's to save time, right? Rather than starting from scratch, a lot of companies will save time by 
building on an existing program, right, where that's saving lots of uh, developer hours. There's another reason why companies use open source software besides saving time. Can anybody think of another reason, the biggest reason of all probably? Companies want to make money, right? So they're saving money by using open source software, right? Typically saving quite a lot of money. We're actually going to talk about that in one of the slides. So what are some examples? <laughs> Linux, everybody knows Linux, the Open Java Development Kit. Apache is the Linux web server, right, that we love, know and love. LaTeX, has anybody used LaTeX before? Nice. Moodle, look at that, open source software. So University of Nottingham is using a lot of open source software. Firefox, does anybody know what Firefox is? It's a web browser. Some of the Android, the Android operating system. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? The Android operating system being open source. So it's a pretty successful operating system. It's quite stable, actually. I, I'm always surprised at how stable the Android operating system is. I haven't rebooted my phone in a long time. I can't even remember uh, exactly the last time I rebooted my phone. <clears throat> Mozilla, <laughs> that's the one I mentioned. That was the, I think that was the first, that might have been the first web browser. I'm not, I'm not gonna swear on the Bible on that one, but it was one of the very earliest uh, web browsers. MySQL, OpenOffice, Blender, VLC. I use VLC every day in, in a lot of these things, IntelliJ and uh, Eclipse. And of course, there are lots of open source companies Right here, lots of open source companies. And this is a funny one, because, you know, does anybody, like, does anybody remember Steve Ballmer? Anybody? I might be asking questions that are, that's a good pub quiz question. It's not very important, actually. But nobody remembers who Steve Ballmer is? Okay, he was the second CEO of Microsoft. That's a, that's, that could, I don't know, that will probably never appear on a pub quiz. But he, he there's, a, there's a viral video of him on, the, on YouTube. There are a few viral video, videos of him. But there's, there's one where he's on the stage at a Microsoft conference and he calls the open source software a cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's seen that one? Nice, you've seen it. Good, extra points for you, extra points. <clears throat> Anyways, so the, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny um, paradox. So there's, even the UK government supports an open source software, right? Be open and use open source. There are some criteria Right, They're like that, that whether or not you can call what you're developing open source. <clears throat> so the range of code adoption, code can be adopted at the level of a few lines of code, a method, a class, a library, a component, a tool, or a complete system. Right, so any level of granularity can be associated with <coughs> open source software. Okay, this is just one uh, kind of example, right? This is from industry. Imagine it, you're an internet or you're some startup company and you're trying to save money, right? Startup companies are not profitable, so they're, they're living on borrowed money. So they're trying to save as much money as possible. Right? So they, they want to set up their company, the infrastructure to their company, and it has all these components. Right? This is the intranet, so to speak, the company view of the technology, and that's the internet, the external view of the company. Right? And 
We want to be able to use all of these services outside the company and all of these services inside the company. So we need, for example, a firewall. These things are usually free, right? We all have free email clients, although the VPNs may not be free. Uh, web browsers and so on. Anyways, we need a firewall, we need a web server, we need dynamic web pages, we need, we need a database server, we need a bug tracker if we're, if we're uh, developing software, for example, at our new company, or we have some, some department inside. We might want a search engine, we want a, an email server, of course we want source control, we already know about Git and Git GitHub, right, and a name server, for example. This is just a kind of schematic of a very, very generic IT infrastructure of a typical software company, right? Using a web server, a dynamic web module to create dynamic web pages from databases, a database server, a search engine, and so on, bug tracking, and so on. So here's the actual software you could use to set something like this up, right? Uh, IP chains, firewall, the Apache web server, um, web Perl, Apache ASP for dynamic web pages, right? Postgres SQL for your database. Um, this, this special open source search engine. There's a, there's a funny bug tracking open source bugzilla, which is a derivative of Mozilla, right? Uh, does anybody know what Mozilla is named after? That where that name comes from? <clears throat> this, this is like, this could actually be a pub quiz question. Did anybody see um, Godzilla? Did anybody ever see that? Extra points for you, whoever saw that. That's like an old, the original Godzilla, I believe, is an old Japanese black and white TV series <laughs> that I used to watch on Saturday mornings as a, as a, as a child. Anyways, very important. Now I'm just being, I'm just, I'm, I'm, it's not very important actually. It's good trivia for pub, pub quizzes, maybe. Okay, so we already know about source control, open source source control, because we're using that, right? In this example, it's called CVS, control version system. That's a predecessor to Git, um, the Git control system. And um, pop, you know, whatever that is. I don't even know what that one is. Right, and then bind, a name server called bind. So that's just an example of setting up a company with open source software to save money. <clears throat> right, here's another one for higher education, like the, con the setting we're in right now. Right, we're at University of Nottingham. <clears throat> University of Nottingham is trying to save money, or they would like to save money, hopefully, although I'm not always sure about that. And it's pretty similar, right? It has an internet and then it has the intranet. There's a firewall, right? There's also, of course, a web server, dynamic web pages, a database server. In fact, there are gonna be many different, uh, you know, database servers, actually. A file system, file synchronization, and uh, encrypted communication in source control systems, right? So that's that's the uh, some open some some configuration of some IT infrastructure associated with a higher education institution. And here are some actual uh, open source software programs that can offer those services, right? That can actually. Uh, fulfill those needs, right? The, the firewall software is going to be the same, right? The web server is going to be the same. The dynamic web pages could be the same. The, the, the um, database could be the same. The file system could be a Linux file system. There's a special open source file 
uh, synchronization system, right? SSH is open source, right, for encrypted communication, and then CVS again for version control. Although, yeah, it's an older version control system. If we look at that though, and we think of the University of Nottingham, it's not using all those technologies, but um, yeah, it's possible to, to replace some of those with open source solutions. Okay, uh, maybe now would be a good time, oh, maybe not, what time is it? I have different times depending on which device I'm looking at. Okay, we still have a few more minutes. Of course, this uh, topic is up for debate, whether or not you think it's a good idea, or there are people that don't think that open source software is a good idea. I personally think it's a very good idea. I guess the counter argument might be, you might try to say something like, well, if everybody can see the software, then uh, it's less secure. But in practice, it's the other way around, right? One of the examples is in that slide of the, the open source Linux web server, which was much more secure than the closed source Microsoft web server, right? It's, it's because if you know your code is going to be seen by the entire world, you do a better job, right? You do a better job. If you know that um, anything you do is going to be seen by the whole world, or could potentially be seen by the whole world, then you tend to do a better job at that. And of course, if you, when you do publish something, somebody else might spot some bugs. You leave the possibility of someone else finding bugs, and then you discover, oh, you might get an email, look, you have a bug in your, in your, um, in your code, and then you can fix it, right? So it collects the intelligence of essentially, uh, potentially thousands of people, right? Anyways, it's a big topic, and there are many different points of view, and, and here's some interesting reading for anybody that's interested in the kind of the, the philosophy, let's say, of open source software. This is a pretty current topic, too. Apple is currently associating with this, associated with this topic. Does anybody know what the, the Apple kind of the, one of the big complaints with Apple products is it's it currently in the news as well. Anybody follow that kind of news, IT news, besides me? <laughs> so a lot of, a very common complaint with Apple products is the inability to repair them yourselves. Right, Apple has always had this policy that if you want to repair an iPhone or a laptop or any one of their products, then you're not allowed to repair it yourself, right? You have to send it to an Apple certified engineer. And that's, that's questionable, isn't it? If you buy something, you should theoretically be able to do with it what you want. Right, and then, and then having these kind of rules saying you're not allowed to do this if you buy a product. Well, it's certainly a good debate to have. You know, it's not black and white. But they have, they're actually changing their policy on that. That's the big, that's the news lately. So they're actually saying, okay, we're, we're changing our minds. We're gonna allow third parties to repair Apple products. Nobody followed that news? No, am I the only one? <laughs> okay, that's fine. Okay, maybe we take a 10 minute break and then, and then we'll talk about soft